chemistry we're beginning a new unit called thermochemistry and this first lesson is introduction to thermochemistry so thermochemistry is the study of heat energy taken into or released by a chemical reaction in thermochemistry we divide a chemical reaction into the system where the reaction takes place and to us that means the chemical bonds that are either being formed or broken because that's where the energy is and that's really what we're studying and then the surroundings that's everything outside the system and that's where the energy goes into if it's coming out of the system or comes from if it's going into the system and then finally uh, the system plus the surroundings together is called the universe so you think of if you dissolve a chemical, which you're going to be doing, uh, like sodium hydroxide, it's going to release heat. And so the heat comes from the chemical bonds uh, of the sodium and the hydroxide ions. And so that's going, to got, that's going to be what you're really studying, is how much energy is in those chemical bonds. And where that energy is released into is the water or the solution where that chemical energy uh, is, is released into. And so that's generally the water that the sodium hydroxide is dissolved in, but it's also the little pieces of sodium and hydroxide ions that are floating around. They will absorb some of this heat as well. So the heat comes, in the, the energy comes out of the chemical bonds in the form of heat, and it goes in, that's the system, and it goes into the surroundings, which kind of catches the heat. You can think of that as, as collecting or catching the heat, and that's mostly water, but it's also little pieces of sodium and hydroxide in the case of sodium hydroxide. And when you take those two things together, that's called the universe. So it's just, that's, it's not the universe as we think of all the planets and the galaxies and all that outer space. It's just our little world inside of a cup, that's the universe. So the change in energy, which is symbolized by delta E, the Greek letter delta means change in, is equal to work done on a system plus the heat absorbed by the system. So there's the formula. The change in energy equals the heat plus the work. If you put heat and work into the system, then it's a positive change in energy because you have more energy in the system. Um, if it's heat coming out of the system or energy coming out of the system and work coming out of the system, then it would be a negative delta E because it's coming out. So if we think of a car, all energy, that is the gasoline, the gasoline is the energy in the car, produces either work, which makes the car move, it, there's the gasoline going into the gas tank, and there's the work that makes the car move or it comes out as wasted heat energy and most actually most gasoline that's burned in a car is wasted it comes out as wasted heat not as actually making the car move so engines are not very efficient so that's basically a nice representation keep that little example in mind of the of what it means by delta e change in energy equals heat plus work Work requires movement against a force. If the only force against a chemical reaction is the pressure of the atmosphere, then no work is done. So work equals force times distance. That's something from physics. If you're pushing on a wall but it's not moving, then there's no work done because it's not moving a distance. But also, if you're pushing against the air, you're not pushing against anything. You're just pushing out against in, into just the openness then there's no force. Uh, you are moving your hands a distance, but you're not pushing against anything, so there's no force. And therefore, um, there's no work. The, this means that a, at constant atmospheric pressure, the equation reduces to E, change in energy, equals Q, equals heat. So in other words, when we're studying in chemistry, we want to study the energy in the chemical bonds and the chemical reaction. And if we can get rid of the work, get rid of that chemical reaction causing anything to move, then what we can do is reduce that entire, uh, that entire system down to simply the change of energy being the heat that goes into or out of the chemical reaction. And that's what we'd like to do. Physics is interested in the motion. It's interested in the work. 
But chemistry, we're interested in the energy that's in the chemical bonds and the chemical reaction. And so if we can get rid of work, uh, then it simply reduces down to the change in energy in the chemical reaction is equal to heat. Now, if we go back to our car example, one way we could do that is put the car in neutral or in park and run the engine. And if you put a big dome over the car, somehow to some way that you could capture all the heat, then you could know how much energy is in the gasoline because none of it is going into causing the car to move. It's just sitting still. And so that is um, the heat. That is that would be the total energy would be the heat coming off the car. So the heat taken in or released by a chemical system at constant pressure is called a change in enthalpy and it's represented by the symbol delta H. So for our purposes, delta H and Q mean the same thing. There are technical differences between them, but for our purposes, we treat them as they, they both mean heat. Q is just heat in general. Delta H is the heat coming into or going out of a chemical reaction specifically. And so you'll see both symbols used for heat, but when it's associated with a specific chemical reaction, you'll use the symbol delta H. And you'll see plenty of examples of this in this unit as we go on. So for the rest of this course, heat entering or leaving a chemical reaction will be represented by delta H, and it represents the change in energy, delta E, of the reaction. So positive delta H represents heat entering a chemical reaction. Negative delta H represents heat exiting a chemical reaction. For the rest of this course, heat entering or leaving a chemical reaction will be, will be represented by delta H. So an endothermic process is when heat enters the reaction and is shown as a positive delta H plus delta H. An exothermic process is when heat leaves the reaction and is shown as a negative delta H. So just remember endothermic sounds like endothermic, the heat's going in. And exothermic sounds like an exit sign, like you go out a door. And so that's heat going out and that's a negative delta H. So remember that money into your bank account is positive and money withdrawn from your bank account is negative. So that's how you remember. Heat going into the reaction is positive, like money going into your bank account is positive, and heat coming out of a chemical reaction is negative, like money coming out of coming out of your bank account is negative. The heat leaving the reaction, the system equals the heat entering the surroundings. Okay, so negative Q of system, the heat coming out of the system, again, that's the chemical reactions, the chemical bonds being broken or, or put together, equals the heat going into the surroundings, okay? So if we think of Hoover High School as the universe and my classroom as being the system and everything outside of my classroom as being the surroundings, then if 10 people leave my room, that will be negative 10 people to the system, to my room, but it will be positive 10 people to the area outside of my room, the surroundings. So if this number is going to be the same, it's just opposite sign. All right, so temperature is the average kinetic energy of molecules. This translates to meaning that higher temperature increases the speed of molecules and temperature is measured in either Kelvin or centigrade. Remember, a degree of, of um, temperature on the Kelvin and the centigrade scale are exactly the same. The only difference is what they call zero. Kelvin calls the lowest possible temperature in the universe zero, so there's no negative numbers on the Kelvin scale, and the centigrade scale calls the freezing point of water zero. But one degree temperature change on the Kelvin scale is the same as one degree temperature change on the centigrade scale. So what if now we take the hot uh, area over there on the left, that hot square, and we transfer some of the heat over to the cooler square where the molecule is moving slower. Okay, so heat is the transfer of energy between two objects with different temperatures, and it goes from the higher temperature to the lower temperature. If you boil a pan of water, it's gonna go from the very hot pan of water into the atmosphere. Uh, but it doesn't have to be the atmosphere being the lower temperature, it could be another object. 
So what happened after the heat transferred is the temperatures will equalize. So those two hydrogen molecules are moving at the same speed once the temperature equalizes. Heat is measured, it has two units of measure. One of them is called joules, which is generally the measure of energy for anything. It could be for electrical energy, mechanical energy, that's like the energy of throwing a ball, um, uh, light energy, sound energy, a lot of different types of energy. Calories is another unit of measure for heat, and that's specific to heat. We don't talk about calories of anything other than heat energy. So the summary of the difference between temperature and heat. So here are two identical blocks at two different temperatures. And now we're going to connect them thermally. It could either be through a duct like a pipe with like a vent with a, uh, that can allow the air to travel across. Or it could be through a um, piece of metal, a metal pipe. And metal pipe will transmit heat. It can conduct heat. So you see the two uh, temperatures are equalizing. So the two, two blocks are now about the same color roughly. So the temperature is equal in both of those blocks. And that will continue until the heat has equalized. So the difference between temperature and heat is, so now you see the temperature is equalized at 350 degrees. So temperature is the internal kinetic energy of the particles in the object. So if you think of those as solid blocks, the, the atoms inside of those are wiggling. Okay, and if they're at a higher temperature, they wiggle faster. That's internal kinetic energy. Whereas heat is the transfer of that thermal energy between two objects of different temperatures. So think of temperature as being internal to the object. It's the wiggling of the molecules or atoms inside that uh, object if it's a solid. And heat is the transfer of that energy across to another object outside. So heat travels outside of the object to another object. You have to have two objects of different temperatures for heat to transfer. So there are many kinds of energy, mechanical energy, throwing a ball, electromagnetic, sound, light, heat, and others. For our purposes, the only kind of energy involved in a chemical reaction is heat energy. There are other kinds, but we're only interested for, for example, work that we talked about earlier, or there's phospholuminescence, which is light energy coming out of a chemical reaction that's like glow sticks. But for the purposes of this unit, we're only interested in heat energy. So here's the key point. The heat energy absorbed or released in a chemical reaction is the same as the energy stored into or released from the chemical bonds of the reactants and the products. So how could we possibly know the energy in these little tiny chemical bonds between atoms and molecules? Well, if we can get the heat, get them to release that energy in the form of heat or absorb energy into them in the form of heat, then we can know uh, how much energy are in those chemical bonds. So specific heat is a measure of how much heat a substance will gain or lose when the temperature changes. Specific heat is specific to a substance. So for water, we saw this um, number back when we did the, uh, the heating curves. Um, water has a specific heat of 4.18 joules per gram centigrade. So that means if you want to take one gram of water and raise it by one degree centigrade, or it could be Kelvin, either one, the, 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 a degree is the same on both scales, you would need 4.18 joules of energy to do that. The formula for the relationship between heat and temperature is Q equals mass times specific heat. Q is heat, so it's heat equals mass times specific heat times the change in temperature. So think about that. We're interested in finding out the heat in and out of a chemical reaction. We don't have a way to measure heat directly, but we do have a way to measure temperature change and you know what that is. It's called a thermometer. So if we can measure the temperature change of the substance and we know what the substance is, by knowing the substance it tells us the specific heat C and we've weighed how much of that substance we have, what's the mass of the substance, we can then calculate the amount of heat. So Q is the heat, M is the mass, C is the specific heat of the substance, and that's a number you could look up on Google or you could look it up in a chemistry textbook. And T is the change in temperature that you measured on your thermometer. The unit of measure 
for energy are joules, pronounced joules or calories, which you've all heard of. So the units of measure for energy are joules and calories. A calorie spelled with a lowercase c is defined as the amount of heat required to raise one gram of water one degree Kelvin or centigrade. The temp one degree on both scales is the same. So you can see that the properties of water are used to define a un uh, many of the units of measure in the metric system. A kilocalorie spelled with a capital C is 1000 calories and is the number used on food products. So the 250 calories on a small bag of Doritos are kilocalories. So this would be 250,000 of the calories that we use in chemistry. So now one calorie, the relationship between calories and joules is one calorie equals 4.19 joules. Some formulas in uh, thermochemistry call for you to use calories. Some call for you to use joules. So you'll have to make this conversion sometimes. There's your equivalency. You can turn that into the conversion factors one over the other and convert in whichever direction you need to go. The advantage of using joules is that it is the same kind of energy used for light, mechanical energy, electrical energy, heat energy, sound energy, everything. Every other kind of energy is expressed in joules, whereas calories is used really only for heat energy. So let's look at an example. Let's say that you took a cup of water and you stuck it outside next to an iron railing somewhere around the campus at seven o'clock in the morning and let it sit there for 15 minutes. You would find if you put your finger in the water, it's kind of cool, it's not real cold, but it's kind of cool. The iron bar, however, at seven in the morning is gonna be very cold. Now you wait seven hours later. The sun has been sending the same amount of energy down on both the cup of water and the iron bar and if you put your finger in the cup of water, it's slightly warm, but it's not real warm. So it's gone from being cool to warm, but the iron bar has gotten gone to, from being very cold to very, very hot. You could probably barely touch it without burning yourself. So in other words, water has only a slight temperature change for a certain amount of heat, whereas the iron bar, you could feel it, has a extreme temperature change for that same amount of heat going into it over that seven hour period. So let's see how that works with our formula. So water has a specific heat of 4.18 and iron has a specific heat of 0.45. How much will the temperature of each substance change if 2000 joules of energy coming down from the sun is absorbed by each substance and you use the same mass of each substance, 50 grams of water, 50 grams of iron. So here we go. So we'll first we'll solve the equation for delta T. So from Q equals MC delta T, we solve for delta T. It's just a small algebra step. So it becomes delta T equals Q, that's heat, over mass times specific heat. So now we're just going to plug in the numbers. So for water, the heat Q is 2,000 joules, the mass is 50 grams, and the specific heat is 4.18. That will give you a 10 degree centigrade increase, not a very big increase in temperature. Now we do the same thing for iron. It's the same amount of heat, or same amount of heat, yes, coming down from the sun, same amount of mass, 50 grams, but the specific heat of iron is much less. And so when you do the math on that, you have a temperature change of 90 degrees. So that, that confirms your uh, intuition that iron, an iron bar really early in the morning is gonna be very cold, and in the afternoon it's gonna get very, very hot. So this explains why on a cold morning an iron bar will be cold and water will be cool. Later in the afternoon, uh, hot afternoon sun, the iron will be hot and the water will be slightly warm. So the higher specific heat of water means it can absorb a lot of heat without changing temperature very much. All right, and that takes care of our introductory uh, lesson on thermochemistry, and we'll go into some examples of calculations with thermochemistry in the next few lessons.